So, not uh, coffee break yet, but almost there. Two more talks in this session on emerging technologies. And the first talk is actually the Best Paper Award, as you've heard this morning. And it's uh, on nan nano-focused X-ray beam to reprogram secure circuits. And it's joint work of Stephanie Anso, Pierre Bleuet, Jesse Cledier, who will present, Laurent Mangol, Jean-Luc Reinhardt, and Remy Tukulu. So floor is yours. Hey, I think it's fine. Uh, yeah. Okay. okay, thank you for the introduction. I hope the talk will not be too boring before coffee time, but uh, I will try to, to do my, my best. Okay, so it's about X-rays. X-rays and gamma rays are the kind of perturbation mean we have in our, in our domain of security analysis. That is quite often mentioned, but if you look in, if you look at the result, in fact, there's, there's nothing really details, and in fact, there's no result, in fact. So, in another hand, there's a lot of ref references in failure analysis and in space system literature about uh, ionizing radiation. So, we, what we really wanted to do here is to, to see what we can do with, uh, with X-rays, to see if it can really be a perturbation mean for, for security analysis. Why using X-rays? It's simple, in fact, the, the answer is X-rays, the wavelength is very small. It's like one nanometer or, or less. So if you manage to, to, to focus X-rays, you can make a very small spot in order to hit a single transistor. When you use visible light or near infrared light, you, you, have a, um, you have a spot size that is like one micrometer. So you, you light a lot of transistors at the same time. Here, with such a small wavelength, you could do much more better. And in the past five years, Synchrotron proposed some beamline that are nano-focused. So we, we really wanted to see what we can do with, uh, with such uh, an apparatus. So a synchrotron is quite a big equipment. Like, you don't go directly to a synchrotron. You begin to do some preliminary tests on more simple equipment. And so to do this preliminary test, you, have, you can do that on several kind of equipment. At, Lucky, at Leti, we are lucky because we have medical equipment, because we design uh, we design X-ray detectors and also algorithms for, for X-ray detectors. And we have also lots of material science equipment, such as, dif such as diffractometers, in order to do crystallography on, on materials, uh, in material science uh, business. So we have been using this kind of equipment to, uh, for, material si oh, sorry, for material science to, to, to do this preliminary, preliminary test. Obviously, this kind of equipment doesn't provide any foc focusing means. So to, um, there's a, like a rough, rough collimator that sends the X-rays to uh, inside the chamber of the equipment. So to, to, to do um, a basic focusing uh, mean, we, what we have been using is, is something very simple. We've used a pinhole in a, lid of, in, a, in a sheet of lead. So you take a drill, a piece of lead, and you make a, you make a hole. So this is what we, uh, this is a, a view of, 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 the, of, the, of, the, of our experiment. Here you have the package of the circuit, like it was a DIL-48 package. The die of the circuit is here. The piece of lead is here, with a pinhole right here. And the X-ray come from the front side. On this screen, in fact, it's, uh, the, the color has a bit crappy, so you don't see the, so well the color. But on the other screen, I think it should be better. And the circuit we've been using for such experiment is the NAT-Mega. Uh, quite an old circuit, like a 0 0.35 micrometer circuit. So lots of people will say it's quite of... Uh, too old to, 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 to look at security on this kind of circuits. But it's a very nice circuit in order to investigate new attack because we, knew, we know very well these circuits. We have reverse engineering some part of it. So it, we found that it's a nice circuit to, to, to do this test. So this is the Atemega. So you have a, a large flash memory, some E-square problem here, a lot of RAM, and some logic carrier here. So you take a piece of lead. You make a hole in it here. You fill the flash with a 55 uh, value everywhere, and after you expose that to, to X-ray. And this is what you obtain after more than three minutes of exposition. So I, I think the color are a bit weak, but you can see a little bit here there's uh, some red. So when there's white, there's no corruption. When there's red here, there's like a, a little moon here. It's a one to zero corruption. We didn't get any zero to one corruption. All the corruption is one to zero. If you continue the exposition, 
you've got this thing. So it's not very clear also due to the screen, but you have some vertical lines that, that appear. If you continue a little bit more, you get more vertical lines. And if you continue, and if you continue more, you have finally all these vertical lines. To understand what has happened, we can consider a, an array of non-volatile memory cells that are composed of an access transistor and a floating gate transistor. The floating gate transistor is used to store the value, and it works this way. Like this is for Atomega. If you change circuit, it will change a bit, a bit more. It can be a bit more different. Basically, when there's charge in the floating gate, the transistor is blocked. So this is the floating gate. The transistor is blocked, and the value that is stored is, is a one. If there's no charge in the floating gate, the transistor is conductive. This conductive state is represented by a green arrow here, and the value that is stored is zero. Now, if you access to a line, so you active the line, you make the access transistor conductive. So this is represented by the green arrow on the, all the active uh, access transistor. And you are going to read your, your value. So it's part of the 55 value, like 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. And so you just read the, the state of, of, your, of the floating gates that are connected to the conductive access transistor. Now, if you put that under the, the X-rays or on this screen, you don't see anything. But I, on the other one, you should see something. But basically, normally, there's a, a round circle here with colors. And what's going to happen, the X-rays are going to empty the carriers stored in the floating gates. So normally, the, the circle is like this, this big. And all the floating gate transistors that are under the X-ray exposure, the floating gate gets emptied. So the floating gate becomes conductive. So this is represented by the red arrows. Obviously, the ones that with the green arrows were already, there was no charge in the floating gate, so they were already emptied, so the X-ray doesn't do anything to this one. But on the, on the one where there was charge, there's no charge anymore, so the, the transistor becomes conductive. Now, if you active a line, you, you have this thing, you're just going to, to, um, to read the corrupted value, that is a zero, because now you have no charge in the floating gate transistor, and so you, have, you are holding a zero value. And so you have, you, it was this little uh, croissant we had in red. It's not a real circle, it's, it's not a real circle just because there's some parallax problem in the, in, in the equipment. So it's, we didn't align every, everything very well, like with the 200 micrometers all, it's not very easy to, to make a good alignment. Uh, this state is like permanent, like the, the floating gates are going to stay empty until the next right operation. So you will, uh, you, you will, uh, in order to change the state of the floating gates, we do need to do a right operation in order to, to change that. Now, if you continue the, the exposure to the X-ray, so remember there's a, like a circle here showing the, the X-ray beam. What's going to happen, it's another phenomenon. The, the access transistors are going to be corrupted. The physical of, of that, I'm not going to enter too much in the detail because it will be a bit boring, but basically the, the X-ray photons create carriers in the in near the oxide of the, of, the, of, of the transistor. And these, these carriers get pinned at the oxide um, barrier of the, of, of the transistor. And these charges that are pinned are going to change the threshold voltage of the, of the transistor. And it's going to change in a way that NMOS are going to be more conductive. And in this case, if, you, if there's enough carriers that are pinned, the NMOS are, co are going to be completely conductive. So this is what is represented by the, green, the red arrow, sorry. So all the access transistors that were under the beam become semi-permanently conductive. It's semi-permanently because this, this, this pin charge, pin um, carriers that, that, that are in near, near the oxide, they are going to manage to escape if you wait a long time. Like if you wait several months, like four months, five months, they are going to escape and the transistors are going to become normal as, as, they, as they used to be. Another way to escape these carriers is to do a little heat treatment. Like, for example, you do a, a one-hour heat treatment at 150 degrees Celsius, the, the carriers will escape and the transistor will become back to normal. So now, if you do an, if you access to the, you, to, if you do an access to your array, you are going to have a zero here. But it will not depend on the active line because this this uh, this curved transistor is, is short circuit is doing a short circuit on the on the, on the colon and so you read zero whatever the active line, and it's why you have this long vertical line that that appears. So from this result, we've got two nice 
from this test, I mean, sorry, we've got two nice results. The first one is that we managed to empty floating gates. And so with flash and square prom, we could modify the, the, the data from one to zero. This is the first result. The second result is we can modify the transistor in a semi-permanently way. So as I've, I've told you, we can make the NMOS more conductive, like we can make them, make them completely conductive. And in other hand, we can make the PMOS more completely blocked. And it's reversible, like if you do, a, if you do a treatment, you can, you can reverse this stage. And this last result is quite nice, because if you apply that to logic area of the circuit, you could, make, you could change the, the, the configuration of the circuit, so you could do some circuit edit. So this is quite, could be a nice thing. These effects are well described in the, in the failure analysis domain. So it's, there's nothing new, in fact, here. The thing is, we have never applied that to our, what we do in our, in, in, in our domain, that is security analysis. Now let's, uh, let's focus X-rays down to the, like, to the nanoscale to, to, to each only a single transistor. It was, uh, it was our basic idea at, at the beginning. So to do that, we go to, to Grenoble. So this is Grenoble in France. The Leti ITSF is located here. And the synchrotron is, is here. It is Big Donut. So it's not very far from the lab. This is inside the Big Donut. Basically, what you have is you have a vacuum pipe that is like one, one kilometer long and you have electrons that are circulating in this pipe. Each time the electron, electrons are changing direction, they are going to emit X-ray photons. And if you, look, if you use a very long focal length optic, you can manage to, foca, to focus these uh, X-ray photons in order to make a very small spot. And this is what we have here. Basically, you have some optics that is here. The photons, the X-ray photons are here, and we put our at omega at the focal point of the of the, of the optic. So it, this is the closer view of the, of the thing. You have, you have the X-rays that are going, going here. It goes through a little mirror that is 45 degrees oriented and that is connected to a, a, an objective microscope in order to have a, a view of the, of the circuit. And so this is the at omega that is, uh, that is on the bench. This thing is a fluorescence detector. Fluorescence detector, to make it short, fluorescence is when you, when you have an atom that gets excited with an X-ray photon, like let's say a tungsten atom, for example, this, this tungsten atom is going to relax its energy by emitting some new, photon, new, new photons with, um, with, a, with a given spectrum of wavelengths, and this spectrum makes a very nice signature of tungsten. So why I'm, why I'm speaking of tungsten is just because on the atom mega, the tungsten is used to connect the, the metal layers. This is the cross-section of the atomega. So you see the metal layers here. There's like four metal layers. The tungsten is, is this kind of thing that makes the connection between the metal layers. And it also makes the connection between the first metal layers to the transistors. So this is the cross-section of the, of, of the atomega that have been done with the FIB. And, and this is the same view of the... Of, the, of this cross section, if you look at the tops uh, from the at the top of the circuit, that is the process. You, you can see the the, the the via that are that are here. And so, when you do a fluorescence, if you if you scan your circuit with the, your X-ray beam, you, you can manage to know what what is under the X-ray beam. And so, if you if you select the, the tungsten, for example, you can know you can know where are the tungsten via. So the via are all the points that are located here. And this is very nice because if you know where are the via, you know where are the, the transistor under. So you, you have a very nice way to, in an accurate way to, 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 to locate, to, to localize yourself in, in, in the circuit. So to give the result we've, we've got on the Atomega, as I just told you, like fluorescence is a very nice way to, to get, to have a very good positioning at the transistor level of your, of your circuit. Flash and square prime can be modified, so it's still a one to zero uh, modification. But now we can do that at the bit level. So we can select one, one bit of, uh, of one transistor, uh, like a, a floating gate transistor, and we can manage to discharge this floating gate in order to change the, the flash or square prime. So there's a good example of what we can do with that in the, in the, pro, in the proceeding. If you read the article, you will, you will see that. I will not detail it here because it will be too, too long. Um, but yeah, the good point here is we can we have really, we, we can really do that at the at the bit level. To continue the, the results on the Atomega, we, we spend some time on the RAM cells. 
And we've seen that we can manage to, to stack any cells we want at the value zero or one by corrupting the, the transistor. Um, you are going to wonder like what's the point of eating RAM and to change this value like semi-permanently. The good thing about RAM is that it uses the, the, the transistor, the same technology of transistors that are in the logic area of the circuit. And RAM is quite easy to, um, to reverse engineering, to, re to reverse. So you can, so RAM make a, is a good choice to, to understand how the, the transistor works in the, in, in the logic part of, of your circuit. And after getting this result on the RAM, we, we've seen that in the, in the logic area, we can manage to change the, the behavior of the circuit. And this is quite nice because we can manage to change like a single transistor or all selected transistor you want. And you could, if you have some hardware countermeasures that could be uh, implemented in your circuit, you could, for example, remove them or do a lot of things that, uh, that could be quite interesting for security purposes. And all this, you don't need to open the package of the die. Like on this, on the, on this photo I've shown you of, of the experiment, the, 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 the circuit was open to, have a, to see the die, but with fluorescence, you can, you can do that without any opening of the, of the package. So this is quite a, a nice, also a nice result. To emphasize the result on the, on the RAM, I will just going to present you this, these pictures. So this is the same view of the, of, of, of the RAM of the circuit where, when we have removed all the, all the metal layers. So we just see the, the polysilicium and the, and the implemented area. Globally, the cells, the RAM cells, like is kind of located here. And you have the, you have NMOS transistor here, PMOS transistor here, and you have your two, your two tail to um, top to tail to, uh, inverters that are connected uh, in here. So the, 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 two, uh, the two inverters are, are here. If you make, if with the circuit, if you make a fluorescence mapping, we can, show, we can see this thing. So we can, show, we can see all the VR of the circuit. Now if we superpose these two images, we've got this thing. So we, the VRs are located here. That makes the connection with the metal layers that have been removed on this same, uh, on this same view. And we have also represented in this figure all the results we've got on RAM. Some results we got on RAM, like we have identified the, the physical RAM address, and we have identified also the, the transistor that you can eat in order to change the RAM value. For example, for this 65 RAM address, if you if you eat this this uh, NMOS transistor, you can stuck your cell at the, at the one value. In another way, if you eat this transistor, you can stuck the cell at the, at the zero value. So this is the result for the Atomega. So just to give some result on more recent technology, like uh, I, I say state-of-the-art technology, but looking at uh, Mr. Lu's presentation before, the figure I'm going to give you is not the top of the state-of-the-art, but whatever. Like to give some result on more recent circuit, I will say that fluorescence mapping still works, like in a lot of nice accurate positioning of, at the transistor level. It's more challenging because in recent circuits, you don't have any more via email in tungsten, so you have to, to, to select other matters in order to, um, to do your, your fluorescence, uh, in order to, to see what's, uh, to, 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 um, to, to locate, localize in the, in the circuit, but it still works quite, quite well. We have studied two, um, two North Flash uh, circuits, one in 90 nanometers and one in 110 nanometers. And for these two circuits, we can manage to have a, a corruption from one to zero at any, uh, any um, of any bit we, we, we previously select. So we, it, it, it works nicely. And on a, on a 45 nanom, nanometers microcontroller, that it, it was a secure microcontroller, we can manage to, to stuck any, uh, any RAM to the value we want, like zero or one, depending of on which transistor we, uh, we, we, we choose. Uh, and still no need to open the package, like uh, this, is, uh, this is due to the good penetration of X-ray in the, in the, in the circuit. Now I'm going to give a little comparison of, um, of how you, compare, you could compare X-ray to other techniques. Like, if you look at the X-ray setup, like it looks like, it look like what you have in a, in a laser bench. Like you, you, have, you have some lights, X-rays, but it's lights, and you focalize this, this light on your, on, on your circuit. The good thing is that the, you don't need to open the circuit. Like you could do that in a, with a package like, that is a genuine package, as like you don't do it all in the package to have access to the front side or to the back side. So these X-rays are, are much less invasive than that what you can do with, with light attack, for example. But if you, if you look at the effects you, you, you have, 
you don't have any effects that look like the laser uh, attack. Like it's, the effect you've got here are mostly semi-permanent effect, and it's more effects. It's effects like you could have with um, doing invasive attack, like losing, using FID, for example. The good point of X-rays is that if you if you mess up your uh, your preparation, you can do a heat treatment and to to put your circuit back to normal uh, normal stage. Like when you when you do an invasive attack with FIB, if you messed up, you are like uh, you, you, you are like stuck. Like you you just have to take a new circuit and you you can lose like a days of preparation with uh, with the fib. Like you don't you don't have any undo button like uh, like like you have with uh, with the X-rays. So this was to make a quick comparison of of the of the, of, the, of X-rays to compare it to to other, other technique of, of perturbation. Now. Let's talk about the cost of such a thing, like, because I'm sure there will be some question about the, how, how, how it costs. If you want to have access to FIB, like a top-of-the-art FIB doing backside and frontside, like in Europe, you will, you will have to pay like 400 euros a, a day. Um, uh, yeah, an hour, sorry. So it's, it's the basic price. Like I've, 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 uh, I've, uh, I've checked it at several places that uh, give access to fiber. Uh, if you want to go to the SRF, like to do all these experiments, we have we, we went to the SRF through the scientific um, channel. It means that we have done a scientific proposal, like one year in advance. They give us time, like four days. Like it was four days in a nice weekend of May with, with sunny and and sunshine. So it's not the best time to go to work, but you. Um, so it's not compatible with industrial um, requirement. But you can go also to, to a synchrotron via, via an industrial channel. You just have to pay. You pay the price for at the OSRF and in Grenoble is 3,000 euros for eight hours. Eight hours is it's what they call the shift. It's in, you remember the, this big vacuum pipe that is one kilometer long. Each eight hours are going to, to, to send again some electron in it. And so when you want to go to the, to the, to the synchrotron via an industrial channel, you have to buy the wall shift that is eight hours. And the price is 3,000 euros. So if my math is still correct, I think the OSF is cheaper than, uh, than a, a FIB access. And so to conclude the, this talk, so we do think that it's this X-rays, like this fo nanofocus X-rays make a new kind of attack. And it's a nice way to do some circuit editing and to avoid some, some, some FIB, FIB preparation, for example. You have, you have uh, this extreme resolution you have, you can use it with, this, with the use of fluorescence. That is a very nice technique in order to, to localize uh, accurately in the, in the circuit. It's true that the tool to access to a synchrotron is not easy. This is true, but at least you can't say that it's expensive. And there's lots of experiments, experiments still going on, so in the future we will make more communication on, this, uh, on, on, this, uh, on these techniques. So that's all for now. Thanks. Is that a question? Thank you for your presentation. Um, isn't it expected when, uh, when the technology shrinks, then the modifi modification of those transistors will be easier? Or uh, did I miss that part? Uh, when you when the when you go to lower technology, then it seems you have like a tough time to change the the voltage. If you are speaking with laser, like visible or near infrared, yeah. If you if you shrink the technology, you you have more effect on the transistor for sure. But for for the X-rays, I'm not sure it changed so much. For the going to, to if you go to smaller technology, you, you, I'm not sure you will have a more uh, easy, uh, more more, um, more effect on the transistor. Like you, um, I will say even you will have less. But the thing with the synchrotrons, it's, it's the, the, the beam is very brilliant. Like there's a lots of energy in the beam, so you don't lack any uh, power to to inject your 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 your, your carriers in yeah the, but that, uh, i think that's the point because when the technology shrinks the power uh, the power voltage also uh, getting lower and then your x-ray has more energy to just modify the content of transistors yeah yeah i, I understand you i understand that but um, uh, yeah the best way to know is to try. Like we, we don't yeah. know. For, okay. for sure, for, for visible light and near infrared light, we, we have seen clearly that going uh, going to newest technology, you have more effect on the transistor for sure. Yeah, and just I'm, one. Uh, I don't know how it will act with, with X-rays. Yeah. 
Difficult and just uh, one quick question. When you were talking about RAM, were they SRAM or DRAM? It was, um, it was SRAM, if I'm correct. Okay. It's not DRAM, for sure. Uh, I'm not a specialist of RAM, but maybe Mr. Luke would tell me if, if it's SRAM or not. It's SRAM, yeah. And Roisis, for sure, it's, it's SRAM. Okay. Quick one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, a question about the positioning. So you, you, if you have the spot, how do you focus it to get the, the, the electrons out of the synchrotron into, into, the, into, in, in, into the chip? Um, the, the spot is already focused. Like the, 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 the beam on this pitch, when you are here, the, the X-ray beam here is like 15 nanometers or on this setup it was 16 in fact, but it's already 16 nanometers, it's already focused. The lens that managed to do this focusing is like 100 meters back on mm -hmm. my back. So, but it's, you don't have any to do, you don't have any focusing, or focusing to do, it's already done, for, already done for you. Okay, so you just need to position it at the right spot. So a this means something like, you need, to, you need to know, you cannot scan, this is, this is a bit harder, right? You, yeah. you need to identify and then you have yeah, a few shots. This is a point I, I haven't spoke about, but to do all that, you, it's not like laser where you are going to, to do a, a scan in black box and you don't know exactly mm -hmm. how, how your design is and you are going to find your hot spot and going to, to just focus here because you know that you are going to make a perturbation that is nice. Here, the spot is so small, you can't do anything like that. You have to mm -hmm. do some reverse engineering of your sample. Like we, the, the time to, um, to prepare an experiment is quite long. You have to really reverse your sample. So, it's, uh, so this means how many shots can you fire if you rent it for a day? Uh, you, you can, uh, when you do a, ch a shot on, on the synchrotron, you, you, you do an exposure of um, 100 milliseconds. So if you want, uh, like in, in a day, you could do a thousand and okay. thousand millions of, of shots. Okay. The thing is, since the faults are, are semi-permanent, at some point your circuit will be completely modified and will mm -hmm. not work anymore. But you just have to do a heat treatment and it's all gone. But, uh, okay. but you are not limited in the number of shots. So okay, thank you. Okay, uh, maybe offline. Yeah. Let's thank the speaker again. So we have one more talk in this session on emerging technologies. It's a novel bypass attack and PDD based trade off analysis against all known logic locking attacks. And it's a joint work of Xiao Ling Su, Biki Shakia, Mark Tehranipur, and Dominic Forte. And presentation will be given by Biki Shakia. Yes. Um, hi everyone. So my name is Biki. Um, I'm a PhD student at the Florida Institute for Cybersecurity Research Fix at the University of Florida. So today I'm going to be presenting my paper titled uh, Novel Bypass Attack and a Binary Decision Diagram Based Trade-Off Analysis Against All Known Logic Locking Attacks. So this is the outline of the talk. So in the first part I'm going to be talking about the concept of logic locking or obfuscation or encryption in general why people do it, why it's been proposed, and some popular methods to do that. After that, I'm gonna be talking about various attacks that have been proposed on the technique recently, and also some countermeasures to those attacks that were also concurrently proposed. And we're gonna be talking about the bypass attack, which is our proposed attack on some varieties of logic locking that try to counter some specific threats. And after that, I'm gonna be talking about a binary decision diagram based functional locking framework and we'll end it off with a conclusion and future work. So in the past few decades, the most prominent business model in the semiconductor industry was the vertical business model. 
in which specification, RTL design, synthesis, all the way to fab, package assembly, they sort of used to be done under one roof, under one design house. Uh, so all steps were produced in-house. However, this is no longer the case because of the increasing complexity of designs, the time to market pressures, and most of all, the exploding costs of top end fabs. So what this business model is getting replaced by is basically a horizontal business model. So in this business model, what you have is a fabless SOC integrator who does the specifications, RTL design, sources IP cores from various third party IP vendors, does the synthesis, verification, DFT, physical design, and all that. And the end result of that is a GDS2 file that gets handed off to a fab who would also have some test facilities to see if the chip is working properly or not. And also there might be parties that might do packaging assembly and finally the chip enters the supply chain. So as you can see over here, different parts of the design process are scattered throughout the globe. And the advantage of such a business model is that it costs are reduced there's quicker turnaround times, and obviously it allows the design house to focus more on IP development. Yeah. However, there's threats associated with this business model, most particularly in terms of the foundry and also the supply chain. So in terms of the foundry, what we can say is the foundry receives the entire design along with the test factors to check whether the chip is working or not. And does it, does it, the, the design house, who is onshore and the fab, assuming it's offshore, the design house has little to no control over the foundry. And as we already know, so there's threats associated with this business model. So there could be the threats of Trojan insertion over production, which we define as producing in excess of your contracted amount, or IPIC piracy, the threat of out of spec or defective ICs being produced, and also cloning. So these threats might be there. And the other threat that comes is once the chip gets fabbed and enters the supply chain, you have various reverse engineers in the supply chain who might be interesting, interested in extracting the IP that is in your chip. So these threats are there. So in response to those threats, so certain gate level measures were proposed in order to protect your IPs or ICs. The most notable of this technique is this technique called logic obfuscation, also known as logic locking or logic encryption in general, which has received quite a bit of attention in the past few years. So the basic premise is to basically take your design at the gate level, although there are techniques to do it at the RTL level and also the layout level. The most prominent one is done at the gate level. And in this technique, you basically have key gates or some sort of logic locking IP core that's integrated into your design. And the most simplest technique is to basically put in additional logic such as XOR gates, MUXs, XNORs, or it could be some other functional block that you incorporate into your design at the gate level. And the basic premise is this locking block is driven by a key input. If you know the key, then your design is, behaves in the way you expect it to behave. But if it comes in the hand of an unauthorized party, since they don't know the key, the expected input output behavior of the circuit is not gonna hold. So with that, it can protect against an untrusted foundry or a reverse engineer in the supply chain who does not know the key, but still wants to prioritize design. So it sort of offers some level of protection against those threats. Uh, however, so the concept itself is pretty simple, but there have been some attacks that have been proposed on such gate level protection techniques. Uh, the first attack that was proposed is based on a simple key sensitization technique where these key inputs that drive your key logic, they're modeled as stuck at false locked chip that the adversary has access to. You could assume that the chip was, this unlocked chip was obtained through the open market or the adversary got his hands on this chip through a previous iteration of the design. So what the unlocked chip basically allows the adversary to do is basically get golden input output patterns. By golden, I mean they're known good input output responses which the attacker can collect. Now using this side information as well as the lock netlist, the attacker basically formulates a sad problem where he basically wants to use these observations and find a key that is consistent with those observations. So, and obviously once you find the key and load the correct key values, your design is basically unlocked. So that's the adversarial model followed in those attacks. Now we'll dig a little deeper into the exact method for this attack. In the SAD based attack, you basically form a simple combinational miter. A miter which is composed of two copies of the netlist, each loaded with two wrong key values, key A and key B. So the output of the miter is the signal Y. And an important concept to note with this attack is basically the concept of a distinguishing input pattern, 
which basically states that whatever input pattern your SAT solver returns when your y goes to 1, that, will be, that is basically a dip, which means since y is the output of an XOR gate, which means if y is equal to 1, y a and y b necessarily have to be different, which basically means either the key a is wrong, key b is wrong, or both of them could be wrong. So any input that produces such an observation is called a DIP. Now what you can do after this is basically take the DIP, apply it on your unlocked IC, and basically get a known good response out of it. Now what you have at number four is basically an input output observation that you know should be expected of an unlocked chip. Now you take this observation and you basically tell the SAT solver to return a key that is consistent with the observation that you just had and you put it to your CNF formulation in the SAT tool. Now this basically iterates all the way through and to make it even clearer, we'll, we'll just have a simple example here where I just show six key values just for the sake of simplicity. So let's say in the first iteration, the SAT solver found a distinguishing input pattern 0010 where the known good output response is y equals zero. And under this circumstance, we can see that, so there's total six possible key values. One of them is guaranteed to be correct for all possible input outputs. And with this first observation that you got from the unlock IC, that you can see that basically k1 through k4 are eliminated. Now note that the attacker isn't actually brute forcing through these keys. He's just using this input output observation as a constraint, so the SAT solver just zooms down on the correct key and not the incorrect ones. So iteration number one, four keys are eliminated two keys are left. In the second one, the first K1 through K4 are already eliminated, and you just have K6, which le is left to be eliminated. So at the end of this, in two iterations, you basically ruled out all your incorrect keys, and you're left with one possible key choice. And if you just think about it in terms of visualizing it, so initially you have two to the power key keys. One of them, or some of them, are correct. And as your SAT solver goes about its way, you add in constraints, your constraint size increases, and at the end of it, you basically zoom down into your correct keys. So the key point to note over here is basically you're using inputs and using them as constraints to basically zoom in towards the correct key. Okay, so in order to resist those kinds of attacks, you want SAT resistant countermeasures. So what these countermeasures will basically focus on is the input patterns and their discriminating ability. By discriminating, I mean what proportion of the keys can they rule out in one single iteration, you want to minimize that. Now, if you want to force this attack tool to just brute force it, which is worst case, you would basically want to have each input pattern rule out a max of one key. So when you run the tool, basically the SAT solver will have to basically brute force the entire key. So that's how you would res resist SAT attacks. Now, how do you actually achieve this Boolean effect? Uh, you basically have your net list and you have a SAT resistant block that you integrate into your design. Now, and also to note is you could have the SAT resistant block and some papers have proposed combining that SAT resistant technique with just regular XOR locking as well. So this was the first SAT resistant technique that was proposed where a simple comparator circuit is basically stitched onto your logic. And this basically brings about the SAT resistant effect that I just talked about in the previous slide. And last year at Chess, also another form of a SAT resistant logic block was proposed which the authors termed as anti-SAT, which the block basically has two components, a G function and a G bar function. Uh, it is up to the user to decide what kind of G and G bar to choose. Obviously, that has implications for how much SAT resistance you have. But in the simplest example, G can be an AND block, and its complementary is NAND, so G bar can be an AND block. The inputs to these logic blocks can either be the primary inputs, in which case it's called secure integration, as per the authors, or if you choose to not use the primary inputs and use internal signals, it's called random integration. The implications of that towards security will be evaluated in the forthcoming slides. Okay, so one thing to note quickly about both of these countermeasures that were proposed is that in order to have strongest SAT resistance, you wanna limit the discriminating input ab ability of input patterns. But a direct consequence of that is if you look at any of the wrong keys, K0, K1, or any of them, and you look at the entire truth table or its functional behavior, you can see that it's wrong on at most one input pattern, which means there is little to no corruptibility for the design if you do load it with the wrong key value. And if you have a hybrid construction, then things get slightly interesting. So basically you, so what I mean by hybrid is basically you have the SAT resistant block with a certain key, KSR, 
and you have the regular XOR locking K. So basically your total key space is two to the power K plus KSR. And you can just think of these as two separate keys. So there's four possible possibilities there, as you can see in that set diagram. So one thing to note here is basically when the XOR keys, which we term as SLL keys over here, when they're wrong, basically you have high output corruptibility, which means the SAT resistant behavior that I talked about in the previous slides, you don't really get that in the first two key spaces. But in the second, um, yeah, but in the, uh, in the two key spaces after that, you basically get the behavior that we talked about, where the discriminating ability of an input pattern is very limited. And if you do feed this entire circuit to a SAT solver, it's gonna have a hard time because these key spaces basically ensure that your circuit is resistant. Okay, so how do we actually go about trying to bypass this kind of protection scheme? So if you do have a circuit that just has your SAT resistant locking scheme in it, as I said before, for any wrong key value, there is little to no output corruptibility. So if you do choose any wrong key, there is at most one input pattern for which the output is affected. So our approach was to basically pick two wrong keys, form a combinational miter, and get these input patterns for which your circuit is misbehaving and be able to correct that. So our goal to summarize is basically to not find the right key, but to make the circuit wrong, work even with the wrong key. So with that, we basically avoid the entire SAT problem and just call the SAT solver twice and just make the circuit work completely 100% even with the wrong key. And what is the, so what are we actually doing? So we just have a wrong key and an input pattern that we wanna correct for. You can just stitch a simple comparator circuit that monitors the circuit input, inputs for this input pattern and basically inverts it after it detects that pattern so that at the end, this entire circuit is functionally equivalent to the unlocked circuit. Now the comparator obviously is an extra circuit that the attacker will have to patch on and its overhead will depend as a function of this equation where N is basically the number of inputs that goes into your SAT resistant block and N out is basically the number of outputs that the SAT resistant block is stitched to. Okay, so what if you have hybrid versions? So hybrid basically meaning if you combine regular XOR locking with SAT resistant locking techniques. So as I said before, if you take the SAT solver and you give it the entire key space, it's gonna have a hard time in these two spaces, right? Because the SAT resistant locking scheme is actually doing its thing over here. But if you look at these two key spaces, this is where the regular XOR lockings, which was vulnerable to SAT attacks in the first place, this region is still pretty vulnerable. So what we wanna do when we find a hybrid circuit, which has both these techniques combined, is basically you wanna modify your SAT problem so that you just focus on these regions. So the SAT attack has an easy time on this key space, but it has a hard time on this key spaces. So what we're gonna do now is basically modify our original SAT formulation to be able to selectively choose which keys to rule out. So there's a portion of the key space that we're gonna get stuck at. So we basically reformulate the problem so that we avoid getting stuck in a ditch where the SAT solver just keeps going on and on. So for that, how do we do it? So in the original SAT formulation, you have a combinational miter with two circuits loaded with two wrong keys, K and KB. But in this case, we form a miter with four copies or N copies of the netlist. Right? and you add the extra constraint, the, C, the complete CNF formulation looks like that. So what you have basically is four wrong keys, and the implication of forming a miter like this is basically in the original SAT attack algorithm that I just showed you a while back, you could rule out at least one or two wrong keys. If you form a miter with N copies, you will rule out at least two wrong keys, right? So if, if with one input pattern you can rule out two wrong keys, that necessarily implies that you have stayed away from the SAT resistant key space and you're only focusing on the XOR keys, which are easy to attack with SAT. So we're just focusing on the parts that the solver is good at and we're just gonna not bother with the part that it's really bad at. So once you reformulate the SAT problem, yeah, so, okay, so this is the results based on just simple bypass on the SAT resistant locking technique. So no XOR gates were incorporated here. A couple of, Things to note over here is that, unlike the SAT attack algorithm, so if you give it a SAT resistant technique, it's gonna basically have to brute force its way through. But if you do our technique, all, the only thing you have to do is find those input patterns for which you wanna correct the circuit. Which basically means if you form a combinational miter with two copies of the netlist, wrong, load them with two wrong keys, you have to do a max of two SAT iterations and then you're done. 
So another observation to make is, so the consequence of our attack is basically you hard code a wrong key value and you have an input pattern for which you monitor your outputs. So once you find the wrong key and you load it in and you find that input pattern, you can obviously resynthesize your design. And since they're hard-coded key values, you could basically apply constant propagation, also known as sweep in logic synthesis. That is basically, the impact of that is that the anti-sad block is basically gonna be synthesized away. So you can see over here, once you apply the locking, you get some overhead in terms of area and quite a bit of overhead in terms of delay. But once you apply your attack and find or fix it on key and find the input pattern, you can see that pretty much all of the circuit in terms of area has been recovered. And delay, obviously, since synthesis tools are based on heuristics, it's not gonna be exact. So you do see some area of delay overhead in this case. In the other case for this bigger benchmark, we noticed that we pretty much got the entire design back intact, aside for a little overhead. So basically, the consequence is we're able to recover the original functionality of the design without straining the SAT attack too much. And also we did a simple experiment with the hybrid versions where we combined SAT resistant techniques with just regular logic locking. And for that particular example, the key length was 64 bits. So if it was a brute force, it would have been at least two to the power 32 because there's two to the power 32 SAR lock keys that were inserted. However, by reformulating the SAT problem, it just attacked the regular XOR keys and our attack finished in about 443 or 820 iterations, which was less than 15 minutes. The higher runtime is attributed to the fact that your CNF formula necessarily becomes bigger because your combinational miter has four copies of the netlist as opposed to two, which was the case in the original SAT attacks. So in, so in the end, basically, with these two techniques, we've basically broken SAT-resistant logic techniques, whether they're standalone or they're combined with regular logic locking. And there's some limitations associated with our attacks as well. So we only target implementations that offer maximum SAT resistance. So where the discriminating input ability of an input pattern is minimized, we can target those techniques. Now obviously, if you have a technique that is not max SAT resistant, our attack is not gonna work. So for a simple example over here, if you have key K0, you can see that for this input pattern, the output is sort of inverted, right? So we can fix that and we can identify it by forming a combinational miter between K0 and K1. However, you can see that for this one, if I form a miter with a circuit with K0 and K1, both of them are incorrect. So when I call the SAT solver and try to find this input pattern, it's not gonna find it, right? So this can happen and we won't be able to pick these kinds of patterns up. So where does this kind of scenario happen? It can happen in, when you do regular logic locking that is just putting normal XOR gates. But obviously we propose the solution to reformulate the SAT problem, so that is kind of taken care of. There's also another variation of the anti-SAT block technique which was proposed last year in chess. So in that technique, if you change the Boolean function in the anti-SAT block, that this, this can happen as well. So that, that is a limitation. Also when you do random integration, so instead of using the primary inputs, if you use internal nets, then also what happens is you have many flips, so that means your bypass overhead, that comparator circuit is stitched in, that is gonna be bigger. So there's also trade-offs associated with our attack. So we found that basically by changing the output one count of, so this is the anti sad block and this is the complementary function G and G bar. So by changing the Boolean functions and varying the output one count of G and G bar, we found that basically there's a trade-off between SAT attack execution time and our attack efficiency as measured in terms of the number of gates required to perform the bypass attack. So basically when one attack gets harder, the attack, other attack gets easier. So for an example where the circuit is extremely hard to attack with SAT, our attack becomes useful. And in the other case, it's the exact opposite. So in common, so basically our bypass attack targets best case SAT resistant logic locking techniques. And we've also reformed the SAT problem to attack hybrid varieties. So a combination of one of these techniques broke logic encryption techniques that have been proposed so far. And the other question now is, can you actually consider all of these attacks in unison? And I think one f way to do that would be to use binary decision diagrams. So what are binary decision diagrams? They are, if they're reduced in order, they're a canonical way of representing a Boolean circuit. They're widely used in formal verification synthesis. And you can obviously go from a decision diagram to a circuit simply by replacing each of the nodes with muxes. And one thing to note is the variable order determines the size of your BDD. So this is one way you can represent your Boolean function. And as a proof of concept, we've also proposed a locking scheme with BDDs where you, this is the BDD for an XOR function. And let's say I introduce a key variable key. 
So if I build a tree structure like this one, it, this allows me to basically select the original function, your correct functionality, f, and based on the key values, select other functionalities as well. And how do you do this at the function level? This is the BD representation. You can do that by adding min terms and max terms selectively. And one thing to note is, so we did do a proof of concept of BDD-based locking. One thing we found was we can guarantee SAT resistant for a given key length, but the problem obviously is area overhead. The ordering in BDDs is based on heuristics. So obviously, if your heuristics are not good for the circuit you defined, your circuit size is gonna blow up. Also, the construction that we showed you for anti-SAT behavior, that was exponential by nature, so you can see exponential growth in the number of nodes as you increase the key length. So there's ways to bring that area overhead down, but again, you'll have to trade off security versus area in that respect. And what are the strengths? So if you do BDD-based locking, you do Boolean function manipulation, which means you have precise control over whatever input patterns you want to share, these DIPs that you want to share. You can also enforce unique set of DIPs and trade them off with overhead. And one thing to note is if you do functional locking based on BDD, it's going to be resistant to key propagation attacks because the basic premise is if all the key gates are convergent, then you won't be able to use ADPG tools to isolate the keys. And obviously one of the challenges is area overhead and you can basically partition your BDDs and do selective locking, but obviously that is gonna be traded off with reduced SAT strength. So in conclusion, bypass is a realistic attack on best case SAT resistant logic locking techniques. It's resistant to SAT resistant varieties, but if you have other varieties, we reformulated the SAT problem and also propose different techniques to combat those varieties as well. And we also gave an introduction to binary decision diagram based locking, which allows you to account for different types of attacks all at once. And the future plan is to basically ask ourselves the question whether we can find a quantitative balance between resistance to all attacks while trying to keep the overheads acceptable. If yes, that's great. If no, then we have quite a lot of work to do. And with that, I'll take questions. Could be just one short because we ran out of time. You used your questions time, sorry. So, questions? Questions? No, so, yeah, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> and all the speakers of this session, and uh, now we have coffee break. <laughs>